The Bob Murphy Show, episode 85. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. Now this one, you're going to do some learning. I'm just going to warn you that up front. And also, I want to suggest that if you haven't been in the habit of doing so, you eschew the audio version of this episode and you go to the video that we're going to be posting on YouTube. And of course, the links for all this will be at bobmurphyshow.com slash 85. So there's two main reasons that I suggest the video on this particular interview. Number one, the audio for my guest, um, it's a little bit more difficult than usual. He, he does have an accent, but that's not really the issue. The issue was just the, the volume of the feed. And he was on a tight schedule the day that I got a hold of him. And so I, I just, even though I could tell it was a little bit high, I just thought, okay, let's just go through with it. So the, the audio is a little bit harder. And I, so I think if you're seeing video of him speaking, it'll just help your brain to understand the words and be easier to follow. But the other main reason is for this particular episode, I'm going to be in the video version, including some screen still shots from excerpts from published uh, economics papers and also a New York Times article that's relevant to the discussion because there's some charts that if you see, you'll understand exactly what the guest and I are talking about. And if you don't have that information in front of you, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to follow the conversation. All right. So before I forget, let me officially say who my guest is. It's Wojtek Kopchuk, who is an economist. He's officially the professor of economics and of international and public affairs at the Department of Economics and School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, a post he's had since 2013. All right. So he is one of the world experts on um, the inequality literature. All right. So let me also say he, here, I'm going to give a bit of a study guide as it were, you know, how if you're reading a difficult text and you want to check the study guide first, it says, when you read this chapter, things to keep in mind, you know, and it kind of <laughs> gives you a framework. So you understand how to interpret That's what I'm doing right now, because there's some really good stuff in this interview, but I'm concerned, especially for those of you who don't have a formal economics background, you, it might just be above your head. All right. So I'll, don't skip the episode. It's important stuff, but I'm going to give you sort of an extended introduction on this particular one, just because I don't want you to miss this stuff. So if you're a professional economist, yeah, I guess you can skip forward, but to be honest, unless you're hip deep in this literature, you probably ought to listen to this intro as well. Uh, also, let me mention if you're, watching the, the video at this point, I'm going to be flashing screenshots even during this introduction. So don't have this on a different tab or something that as I'm talking it, when it's relevant, I'll pull up the, uh, the image as well. So the background here is Thomas Piketty comes out with his book capital in the 21st century, making a lot of provocative claims. Oh, the return of the rentier class and the capitalists are achieving a status that you know they haven't had since before the First World War, you know that kind of thing. And besides Piketty, the other two leading lights pushing this narrative to warn people that wow, inequality is becoming much more concentrated um, or much more severe, let's say, and this is a growing threat, were Gabriel Zuckman and Emmanuel Sayez, right? So two other economists who are publishing a lot in this area. And so what's interesting is their work, which was, it was coming out right when Piketty's book dropped or in the same general time frame. And so Piketty, when he was getting pushed by critics who were saying, whoa, we think you're exaggerating some of these trends at the time, like soon after his book came out and he was, you know, this huge household name all of a sudden, because his book was a bestseller um, he was pointing to, oh, there's new papers coming out from these guys, Zuckman and Saez, that show that I, if anything, understated the degree to which inequality is increasing in recent years. All right. And so what was interesting is the way Zuckman and Saez, the, the techniques they were using to show this alarming concentration of wealth inequality was very different from the trend that had been published about a decade earlier by Sayez and a co-author. And that co-author was none other than Wojtek Kopchak. All right. So 
it's it's interesting that the new technique that Saez and Zuckman were using that was rhetorically serving to also justify the claims made in Piketty's work. And of course the subtext of all this stuff is, ah, that's why we need much higher taxes, not only on income, but also perhaps wealth, at least for, for the wealthy and upper income earners. Um, it's, so it's interesting that that new research was directly at odds with one of those authors own co co-authored papers from a decade earlier. Okay. And so that's partly what's going on. So just so you see what I'm talking about, here's, if you're looking at the video now, so here is a screenshot of a, um, of the, of an article that Kopchuk and Saez co-authored in the national tax journal. And so the title is top wealth shares in the United States, 1916 to 2000 evidence from estate tax returns. And then the money chart from that, which I'll now flash for you, you'll see is this, that was figure two from their paper. And so it says the top 1% wealth share in the United States, 1916 to 2000. Okay. Let me just stress right now. There's a distinction between income and wealth inequality. So for the first half of this interview that I'm, where I'm talking to Wojtek here, um, we're going to be focusing on different techniques for measuring wealth inequality. And so specifically, we're going to say things like, oh, how much of total wealth is owned by the top 1%, things like that. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that we're looking at. So you see in this chart, far from being alarming, it shows that as of, you know, this paper that was published based up through 2000 data, and again, one of the co-authors here was Saez, who is, you know, certainly not a, a libertarian. He's, he's one of the leading voices now arguing for higher tax rates on the wealthy. You can see that, oh, in the early 1900s, the share of the top 1% bounced around between 35 and 40%. Then it dropped way down. And then it kept going down, even in the late 70s. It came up a little bit in the 80s and bounced around a bit. But basically from the mid 1980s to through the year 2000, which is the latest data point they had when this paper came out, the concentration of wealth owned by the top 1% was the lowest it had been as far back as their data went to 1916. All right. And there was no upward trend. You can see it's a flat line from the eighties forward. Okay. So number one, it was the lowest it had been as far back as their records went. And number two, there was no upward trend. I mean, I guess if it was the lowest that had been, there could be an upward trend, but you get what I'm saying. All right. So certainly this paper did not say, whoa, raise the alarm. All of a sudden the rich are getting richer at an alarming rate. And we better act quickly before Bill Gates owns everything or his kids own everything. All right. That's not the, the message you get from this. So now what's interesting is as a, again, one of the authors on this paper later on teams up with, Gabriel Zuckman and publishes a new paper using a different technique that shows not only is the share of wealth owned by the 1% higher than the earlier work had indicated, but that there's a massive trend now in the data where it had come way down after World War II and then turned around on a dime in the, either the late 70s or early 80s and then started zooming way up again and was continuing to rise in an alarming rate. So a drastically different picture. So one of the papers that uh, Wojtek published after Zuckman and Saez came out with their new paper was he just evaluated the different techniques. All right. And so, um, and that, and so that's what we're going to talk about in the first half of this interview that you're going to listen to in a minute is I just ask him to explain the different techniques. So let me just mention very quickly. The first thing he mentions is, like Forbes magazine goes and interviews the wealthiest people. It's like the Forbes 400. So if you just look at over time, the wealth owned by the richest people that Forbes talks to there, you can get a rough sense of, gee, are, are the rich. So it's not just a matter of are the rich getting richer, but is the growth in wealth among the super rich faster 
than the growth and wealth among everybody else. That's really the issue when we wonder, is there an increasing concentration of wealth at the top? All right, so that's one thing, but that's not very scientific. And so the three, though, that are you know serious techniques used in this literature are you can look at estate tax returns, and that's what um, Kopchuk and Sias did in that National Tax Journal article, the one I showed you. So again, using estate tax returns, at least up through the year 2000, there was no upward trend in concentration of wealth ownership. And in fact, from the 80s, mid 80s through the year 2000, that was about the lowest that the top 1% had owned in terms of wealth concentration going back at least to 1916. Okay, so that's what happens if you use estate tax data in order to to get these estimates. So what does estate tax data mean? It means when you die, you have to file returns for your estate tax. And so arguably that's a pretty good snapshot of how much wealth did that person have at the moment of death. Okay. Um, now the problem is, let me just mention it before I lose the train of thought. Strictly speaking, if every year you're just looking at the estate tax returns that's not telling you the concentration of wealth among the population, which is what we're interested in. That's telling you the concentration of wealth among the people who died that year. And those, of course, are different things. And you might say, well, isn't it going to be the same? No, because what if billionaires, because they have access to better medicine and diet and such, and they're not as stressed out, maybe they tend to live longer. So they have a lower mortality rate than people who are at the 50% income bracket or something, right? So you can see how that would affect it. Because technically what you want to do to get an estimate of the living population's wealth concentration, you want to look at the estate tax data and then um, use the mortality rate for someone of that category, you know, for each person to try to back out and say, okay, this person died, his estate was worth 2.7 million. We think there's probably... 620 people just like this guy still walking around because, you know, there was a one in 620 probability that someone with these characteristics would have died this year. And so therefore let's assume there's 620 people right now that have this much wealth and that's the way you do it. And so then you go ahead and, and estimate and say, okay, of the population now, what do we think the top 1%, how much of the total wealth do they own? That kind of, that's kind of text, right? So the mortality rate is a necessary component in that sort of calculation because the estate tax data again just tells you what's the wealth concentration among the people who died that year whereas we're interested in the people who are alive okay the other technique is um the survey of consumer finance or scf as it's abbreviated in, in this literature and then finally there's the capitalization technique and that's the one that saez and zuckman used after piketty's book came out in order to publish these dramatically different trends in wealth concentration or inequality that apparently justified all of Piketty's warnings. All right. And so specifically, how does the capitalization method work? It looks at income tax return data, right? Because income is different from wealth. Wealth is just, you know, the, the assets you own. Income is how much income <laughs> are, are the assets generating. So if you have a thousand or sorry, you have a, yeah, let's say $100,000 in the bank and the bank pays you 1% interest, then your income earning that year, your interest income is $1,000. So you report to the IRS $1,000 in interest income, but your wealth in terms of that checking account balance is $100,000. Okay, so if, I, if you just know like interest income, but you know the rate of return on those assets generating the income, then you can back out what the wealth is, Right. So if you're looking at the income tax, they say, ah, that guy has $1,000 in interest income. And we know that the asset generating that has a rate of return of 1%, then that means we can extrapolate and say he must have $100,000 in wealth. Okay, so that's the technique by which Zuckman and Saez looked at income tax data over time and used it with assumptions about what are the rates of return on various ass asset classes to correspond to those income types. Cause you know, you get pretty, pretty detailed information on people's income tax returns about what sort of asset generated it. And then they back out estimates of wealth. And so looking at that over time, they found a dramatically different trend. Okay. So here, now I'm showing you 
you can see this is figure one. So this is from Kopchuk's paper where he's analyzing the different techniques. And so you can see here of the three I mentioned, the estate tax um, method, the survey of consumer finance, or the capitalization method, you get dramatically different results. So the blue lines in this diagram I'm now showing, you can see that he's got two sets here. He's got for the top 1% and the top 0.1%. So the, the story is the same e either way. But noted, so the, the issue here is look at the, at the pattern from 1980 forward. So the, so the, the grayish line is the capitalization method. And you can see that, oh, it, it peaks um, basically 1929, right before the stock market crash. Then it comes down dramatically and then troughs in the late 70s. Then it turns around and starts shooting way up. And it's, it's not just a straight line. It's actually, you know, accelerating upwards. And you can see how it's, it's zooming up such that as of the last year of data that they had, which I think was in like 2012, 2013, something like that, you can see that the line is as high as it was going back to the 1930s. Okay, so so they you know people could say, "Wow, look at this inequality!" Since Ronald Reagan came in and cut tax rates on the wealthy, inequality has been soaring, and now it's reaching levels that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. And if this trend continues, it's going to go back to what it was, you know, in the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, when there was basically no constraints on the rich and what they could do and amassing their fortunes, right? So that's the narrative that that gray line is supporting. So again, look at how that's diametrically opposed to the blue line, the blue line, which is the series you generate using the estate tax technique. And again, it's not like one set of authors was from the Heritage Foundation and the other one's from MIT. The gray line and the blue line, the papers that generated those results, both had the same co-author, namely Emmanuel Saez. So that's kind of interesting, all right? And so partly what's going on here is um, I'm going to ask Wojtek about what Saez has said when people asked him, gee, now that you're co-authoring this research with Zuckerman, how come your results using this new capitalization technique where you take income tax returns and then back out what the estate must have been that generated it or so the wealth must have been that generated it. How come that's showing such a dramatically different pattern and trend than the earlier work you did with Kopchuk, which showed a flat concentration, at least up until the year 2000. Okay. So that's the kind of stuff that he's going to talk about with me. Okay. Also too, you see this, this dark line in this particular image, that's the, what the survey of consumer finance gives you. So there, there's a gentle upward trend, but notice it's not that big of an increase in concentration of wealth among the top 1% going from the early 60s up through, um, look, I'm just eyeballing the chart, like 2012, something like that, 2013. Okay, so a, an upward trend, but nothing nearly as dramatic as the huge surge in inequality from the late 70s to the what was then the present using the capitalization technique. Okay, so that's... So again, you can, you can see why this is a, is, is a big difference here, and that's why it's so important to know the differences in these techniques and what their pros and cons are. Because again, according to one measure, inequality is not increasing. It's not a big deal. In fact, it, it, as of 2000, it was at the lowest level it had been in a century. And then, but according to the other technique, whoa, it's, it's going through the roof. <laughs> With all this stuff, and you do a Seinfeld... Rising inequality, not that there's anything wrong with that. Okay, so here, let's just stipulate that the concern and hand rigging over this stuff is justified. I'm saying even just looking at these numbers, it's interesting to see where this stuff comes from. Okay, now, change gears, let's talk about income again. And what happened is, fairly recently, Saez and Zuckman, because they have this new book coming out, they had this promotional campaign, and they had an an opinion piece in the New York Times. So now I'm showing the screenshot of that. So on October 11th, 2019, they had a piece run that was titled How to Tax Our Way Back to Justice. And the subtitle is, It is absurd that the working class is now paying higher tax rates than the richest people in America. Okay, and what they found was that the, so here I'll show another screenshot here. 
you see the top, the total tax rate among um, the bottom 50%. It, it depends which, which uh, was it decile? Is that the term from, you know, because they, they split the income distribution up into like the bottom 10%, the bottom 20%, the bottom 30, you know, that those brackets. And so you can see here that the total tax rate, so that what they're doing is they're looking at all the types of taxes that are paid in America, not just income taxes, but also payroll taxes. So that's social security and, and Medicare. The, what looks like FICA on your pay stub, if you've seen that. So that's different from the income tax. Um, but also consumption taxes, right? Like if there's sales tax you, at the gasoline pump, you pay a tax. Um, if you own a home, you pay property tax. Okay, so they take all that tax stuff and then they try to apportion it to say which income groups bear the burden of those tax payments. So with all that stuff put together and then divided by your income, that's the effective total tax rate, right? How much of your income are you paying to taxes at all levels of government? That's the idea. So using that calculation, they discover, lo and behold, the bottom 50%, as you can see in this chart here, um, the lowest tax rate is 23.5%, and everybody else is a little bit higher than that, okay? In contrast, if you look at the top 400 people, right, so they're all billionaires, I think, then you can see that, that using this technique, they calculate that the total tax rate is only 23%, which is less, of course. And so that's, you know, how this paper was trumpeted to say, oh my goodness, the tax code now is so crazy, you know, with decades of Republicans coming in and making it more regressive is the narrative with, you know, Donald Trump uh, lowering the corporate tax rate being the latest outrage in this line of, in this you know, string of uh, events that billionaires now pay a lower tax rate on their income than the, the working class, okay? So that's, that's the claim. So the second half of the interview, I have Wojtek just explain some of the choices that the authors had to make in order to get that result, right? So it's, it's not just an obvious open and shut case is to say, oh, well, this is how much tax the person paid and this is what the person's income was. You just divide the two and that's the tax rate. It, it, it actually gets very tricky when you want to say, how are we going to decide who paid the tax on this? And also to decide what's the person's income, right? So both the numerator and denominator, there are some choices you have to make when you're going to do a calculation like this that are not obvious. And the point is Saez and Zuckman deviated from what was standard in this literature in several key respects that all pushed the answer that they got. Okay. So that's, partly what we're going. Let me just briefly explain um, the choices, some of the choices. So for example, for income, for the, for the denominator, the question would be, huh, um, if the government gives you food stamps, is that a form of income? And so does that, you know, someone receiving whatever, $1,000 in food stamps over a certain time period, should that person's income in that time period be augmented by 1000 or should we not count that, right? So that's one example of a choice that you'd have to decide. And I think Zuckman and Saez basically say, no, money received either literally or in kind in terms of benefits from the government, that doesn't count as income. Okay, so you can see how that would tend to increase the tax rate that the working class pays because that would shrink their apparent income. And so, you know, if it's taxes divided by income, if you make their income smaller through that choice, that raises the apparent tax rate. Um, now, as far as the taxes and who pays them, there's a difference between the person actually writing the check and the person who economically bears the tax. So, for example, let's take payroll taxes, the Social Security tax. You're technically, you're if you if you are a salaried employee working for a company, your employer every time they give you a paycheck. On the side, they also take your gross pay and then a certain percentage of that they have to send additionally to the government on your behalf as the so-called employer share for Social Security and Medicare. All right, so that's not money you ever see that's direct, you know, directly subtracted from your paycheck. You, what you see is the employee share. So the point is the amount you see in your pay stub that's taken out for FICA, the employer also, every time they pay you, 
are doing a similar calculation and having to send in money on your behalf. So in practice, economists think that generally speaking, what happens is um, the employee's wages adjust to take that into account. So that it's not, even though the employer technically is writing a check to the IRS on your behalf because of that, that, or the treasury, that that just means they pay you a lower wage than they otherwise would have. Okay, so it's so the the argument is economically you the worker are actually bearing the burden of the so-called employer half of payroll taxes even though it's not literally coming out of your paycheck in terms of looking at a subtraction. Okay, so because of, so if that's the decision you're going to make then what you would say is ah if we look at total payroll taxes collected we would say that the workers are the ones bearing that burden and then you would allocate it you know according to their income and so forth. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that's going on here to make these calculations is we have good data on total tax return or the total revenue collected from various types of taxes. But when you try to say economically, who are we saying actually, quote, pays for it in real terms or economically, that might be a different person or institution than the person that's literally writing the checks. Okay, so that's the idea. And so you'll see there's a lot of um, issues involved with those choices. And so Voitech is going to walk through some of those issues. All right. Well, that was a very long intro. But like I said, I, this is a, a very um, subtle analysis here, but it's important since this is at the heart of a lot of these drives to raise uh, income and wealth taxes. And so I thought it was important to make sure that you, the listener, understood what was going on. So now, without further ado, here is my discussion with Wojtek Kopchuk. Well, uh, Wojtek, thanks so much for joining me on The Bob Murphy Show. It's my pleasure. So um, I gave a little bit of, of your background to the listeners already in the in the section I recorded separately, but maybe just for those who are you know wanting to, to learn about your background a little bit, can you just explain... Um, you know, what, what your position is and, you know, so what your research covers as it pertains to uh, the inequality literature? Hi, so uh, I'm a professor of economics at uh, Columbia University at the Department of Economics and uh, at the, something called School of International and Public Affairs, which is the School of Public Policy. Uh, I work on uh, tax policy and inequality. Uh, I would say tax policy is really the main thing I work on, although in the, in the recent years it has drifted, uh, or I got dragged into working on inequality. Uh, and uh, on the inequality side, I've, been, I've done a bunch of things uh, that are about earnings inequality or wealth inequality or uh, correlation of wealth across generations and... Uh, uh, Various other things. I used to work on uh, inheritance and the state taxation, so that uh, got me into uh, into these inequality related topics as well. Okay, great. And then, um, am I so some of the other big names in this literature that you people will have been citing recently? Of course, there's Thomas Piketty, and also um, Saez and, and Zuckman. I don't know if I'm pronouncing their names correctly. Yeah. And so, I just want to mention because you pushed back on some of, the, of these issues. And so that's why just as establishing that, you know, this isn't purely like ideological or something that you actually co-authored um, with Saez, right? Two two papers on inequality? Yes, uh, I, I, I worked with Emmanuel uh, uh, first uh, uh, in the early 2000s. We wrote a paper on uh, wealth inequality and uh, using, well, using estate tax data, uh, Trying to measure the trends in wealth inequality over uh, over the course of uh, of the century, and then uh, uh, another paper uh, that was based on uh, uh, micro data from Social Security Administration uh, going back to 1930s sort of over a very very long term uh, and kind of measuring trends in uh, in earnings inequality and uh, the extent to which uh, earnings change from one year to another, so something called earnings mobility over the life cycle. Okay. Yeah. Great. And so maybe just to start things going here, um, I liked your journal of economic perspectives article in 2015, where you, um, were just laying out three of the different approaches to measuring 
the share of, of wealth concentration. So um, can you just really, you know, for a lay person who hasn't heard of this stuff before, you know, why is, how could economists possibly disagree or what, you know, why is it not just obvious <laughs> what, you know, to, to say has the, has the upper 1% or the upper, you know, 0.1% their concentration of wealth ownership over the, over the last 20 years, why is there any even dispute among economists on that? Like, isn't it just a fact like going and measuring the temperature? <laughs> because we have no data, no good data to uh, to measure these things. So uh, effectively, you have to uh, uh, infer from very, very imperfect data that uh, that exists. And uh, uh, the well, there are kind of four sources, but the fourth one is uh, the fourth one, I'll start with the fourth one. It's uh, Forbes 400. Uh, so it's you know, constructed by journalists. It's uh, 400 uh, uh, richest people in uh, in the US. Uh, some numbers are there. Uh, how good are they? I'm not really sure, but you know that's, uh, that's one thing that people rely on. Uh, then uh, the three other methods, so uh, one of them uh, is what I worked with uh, Emmanuel says in the early 2000s. Uh, uh, so the idea there is that uh, you look at uh, estate tax returns, so tax data, people who, who died, and you try to learn from that about uh, wealth distribution of people that are alive. So the uh, the idea, it's called the uh, estate multiplier technique, and the idea is basically that uh, you look at uh, mortality uh, rates and say for a person of a given gender and age, uh, the risk of dying in a given year is uh, 1% then uh, you, know, you see that person in the state tax returns and you assume that there, there is 100 people like that, one over 1% uh, that, are, that are still alive. So that's one approach. Uh, it has its problems. Uh, uh, state de tax data is very imperfect. It's what people report. It may not be the truth. Uh, no mortality rates. Is, uh turns out to be a hard problem because uh, uh, you, you can kind of know mortality rates for the general public, but uh, when you look at uh, at people at the top of the distribution, they they may live longer. Actually, there's good evidence that they live longer. So there is so there there there's some uh, there's a serious problem to what numbers to use in that context. Uh, it's uh, uh, wealth at death. So you know, anything that people do in terms of planning uh, that uh, leaves their estates is going to, to create an issue there. But that's one method. Uh, the second method uh, is uh, to rely on surveys. Uh, surveys of wealth are problematic because uh, uh, well, first of all, I mean, people have to tell you these things. That's true about all of the surveys, but uh, especially when you're interested in the very top of the distribution, uh, then uh, you have to get enough people from the very top of the distribution. So if you, if you are, say, if you have you know, uh, 5,000 people selected at random and uh, you want to study five, uh, top 1%, uh, no other problems, it would be 50 people that are in the top 1%. That's not a very big sample. So we need to look at surveys that, uh, that specifically focus on, uh, on the top of the distribution. And uh, there is one like that in the US and that's called the Survey, survey of Consumer Finance. And uh, uh, it tries to go after uh, you know, uh, very wealthy people identify them. You know, there are issues about identifying them. Uh, they don't necessarily want to respond. They may not tell you the truth and so on. So there are uh, problems along these lines. And then uh, uh, the third paper, which is uh, uh, work of uh, uh, Saez, uh, Saez and Zuckman, uh, the most recent or more recent paper on uh, uh, on on, the, on wealth concentration is using uh, something called the uh, capitalization technique. So that's also uh, primarily rely, that's also primarily relying on uh, on tax data, uh, not exclusively, but sort of the biggest part of that is uh, is tax data. And the idea there is that uh, when you see somebody, uh, let's say. Uh, you know, having uh, a million dollars of interest income and you know that the interest rate is 3%, then uh, you can go from million dollars of interest income divided by the 3% and that will give you uh, the, underlying, uh, the, the underlying stock of assets. So you learn from income about, uh, about the assets. 
you know, that also has problems, uh, and uh, the problems there have to do with uh, knowing what's, uh, what's the right rate of return to apply uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to you know, each type of income and uh, particular people, base of return can, can be different for people that are rich than for people that are poor or uh, people that are in, in the middle of the distribution. So that's, you know, these, these are uh, uh, types of issues. And again, you, you rely on, uh, uh, on tax data. When you rely on tax data, uh, uh, not everything generates income. Uh, you can have uh, control over the realization of income and various other kind of issues along these lines. Uh, so, you know, there are different approaches and uh, each of them has a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. Okay, great. Thanks. And let me just have two follow-ups on that just so the listeners understand some of the complexities or the nuances. So when it comes to um, the, the second main technique you mentioned of of the estate tax data, and that's what you and, and Sai has worked on. Um, and so and so there, it, like, so you have, uh, unless people, you know, flout the law, but assuming people correctly report and so forth, that would seem to be pretty official but that's only, of course, giving the wealth distribution of everybody who's actually died. Yeah. And so if you're trying to use that data to then back out and say, of the people currently living, you know, what's the, what's the distribution of wealth? And for the listeners, I want to stress that right now we're talking about wealth, which is not the same thing as income. Yes. And, um, <clears throat> and, and, and so and partly why I'm, I'm delving into this, is, as you know, um, is that, depending which series you use, there could be dramatically different trends. Right. And so when you, right. you, when you guys were looking at the, the, the wealth concentration using the estate tax data, it was pretty flat from, what was it like from the eighties through 2001? Yeah. Yes, uh, it was flat, but uh, okay. Uh, so it's my own paper mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I will criticize my own paper sure. uh, because uh, I, you know, it made assumptions, and uh, there is one assumption in particular that uh, uh, we always knew was uh, potentially problematic. We just didn't have better evidence. And uh, the, that assumption is that we, we need to assume what's the mortality rate for, uh, uh, for people at the top of the distribution. Mm -hmm. If we don't know that. Uh, we have some uh, partial evidence from particular periods of time, uh, particular years. So basically what we relied on was the assumption that, uh, uh, that uh, the difference between general public and the rich uh, in terms of their mortality uh, stayed uh, constant. Uh, there were no major trends in, the, in that differential. Right. We now have evidence that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there was some trend and probably non-trivial uh, non trend. Uh, which means that uh, uh, where we saw the flat line, it's, it, it was uh, likely increasing. Uh, it still doesn't get you to, to the numbers that you see uh, in some other papers. But uh, uh, basically, you know, when I look at uh, you know, the paper from 15 years ago, uh, uh, there are updates to, uh, to how that series should look like. There was probably an increase. Uh, it's just that... Uh, uh, what, uh, we, we didn't know it at the time. Sure, right. But uh, I'm just explaining so the listeners realize that d depending on which method you choose, you couldn't get dramatically look different looking trends, not just the absolute level, but the you know the trends. So that right. So when when Thomas Piketty's book, of course, came out, was a real big deal. I remember um, Size and Zuckman then came out with their the capitalization right. method, that third main technique you mentioned. And yeah. they were getting dramatically different results. Right. And it was so ironic I, because Saez was a co-author. So it was like Saez and Zuckman were overturning uh, well, that's, that's, and Saez. Uh, yeah. Okay, that, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you write a paper and uh, uh, you know, ideally uh, we are open to new evidence. Right. And uh, if the new evidence goes, uh, goes in a different direction, you know, that's... That's what it yeah. is. Uh, like, you know, it's hands above the table, our data is there, uh, all of these things. Uh, so, uh, so that part is, uh, is fine. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, my reading of, uh, of, uh, of the evidence on all of this is that, uh, 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 one, uh, with the updates, the estate tax series uh, doesn't get you to the same results that the capitalization method gets you. And uh, the survey of consumer finance, with, which is uh, the other method, mm -hmm. uh, also doesn't get you to the to the same results that uh, that capitalization method shows. 
And the estate tax and survey of consumer finance, I would say, uh, they are broadly similar in terms of trends. Right. Right? They are not exactly the same in terms mm -hmm. of the level, uh, but there are other issues. Uh, uh, <laughs> there, there are lots of complexities. Sure. Here, right? So uh, it, there is a question of uh, uh, of what's your unit of observation. So survey of consumer finance is a household uh, household survey. Mm -hmm. So you think about inequality among households. Uh, estate tax returns are individuals. Sure. Uh, that's not the same. That's not right. the same as a couple. So uh, you can uh, you can have somewhat different levels because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, estate tax returns uh, uniquely among the, all these different sources are actually pretty good to show that. Uh, because people are very happy to report that and potentially, you know, not report, report positive assets. So that's something that pushes right. these things down. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the bottom line is that, uh, uh, okay, so uh, I will, my reading of the evidence uh, is that uh, these two methods, surveys and, uh, and the state tax returns, uh, uh, show an increase in wealth inequality that's uh, you know, decent, but not uh, very dramatic. The capitalization method, the way they have it in their paper, shows something much, much sharper than uh, uh, than those two series. Uh, so that's one. Uh, but my concern uh, there was more about uh, you know, the results are what they are. Uh, I can, I think, I can point to specific problems uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, that 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 uh, that generate the results. So that. Uh, that was you know, part of the comment. Right, right. So let me, again, just because it's a, it's a subtle point, but I want the listener to get, because it's and I think it's really interesting. So the, the reason the mortality, so, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe when people asked Saez, hey, how can it be that your new work with Zuckman on this d differs so dramatically? And then and he brought up the mortality issue is, is one of the, the main drivers is in my okay. career. So, and so he's bringing, uh, they, they are bringing up two issues. So one is mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't get you all the way there. Uh, the second one that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that they are pointing to uh, is their belief that uh, uh, tax evasion has been increasing over time. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so they would say that uh, there is a growing bias in, uh, uh, in the series that's constructed based on the estate tax rates. Uh, I'm somewhat skeptical about uh, the second explanation mm -hmm. that we can talk why, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I do want to come back the, the, real quickly, though, just so people get what the mortality... So the, l let me say it in plain English, and then you tell me if I'm, if I'm getting the essence or if, if I'm misunderstanding. So because the estate tax data is just showing... It, like, in a sense, it gives us the distribution of wealth among the people who died in a given period. Yes. And so it matters, of course, just to say, well... What's the probability of so if um if 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 richer people are less likely to die, then uh, in a given year, yeah, in a given yeah, in a, right. <laughs> Everybody presumably it's <laughs> it's empirically it's asymptotically towards one hundred percent. Um, then it's uh, then for a given dead person who's you know of a high net worth, you would say, oh, there must be more people like that walking around alive with that much wealth if, you know, wealthier people li live longer. But your point was, if all we're, if we're just talking about the trend, it's not enough just to say, oh, wait a minute, rich people live longer on average than poor people of, you know, other, other things yeah. equal. It would have to be that a richer person lives longer than a poor person, even more so in 2005 than he did in 1985. Yes. For, for that so that, to be, yeah. Well, so that, that's the so our assumption was that, that that's not happening. Right. The work that uh, uh, that uh, that has been produced since then shows that that has been happening. Okay. Yeah, or the best work on the mm -hmm. on this topic. So then it becomes the question of how much of that was happening, uh, to what extent this uh, this difference has been growing. So that's you know that's a quantitative point, uh, but. Uh, 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 that's actually they have implemented uh, uh, the uh, the update that sort of takes uh, into account this uh, this newer evidence, and it doesn't get you mm -hmm. uh, you know it gets you some way, uh, but it doesn't get you all the way to okay, uh, right. uh, to, to their numbers. And so then for the other, I, I, I'm completely on board with doing that update. Sure, right. Well, it, I think that's a, that's a perfectly fine thing to do. Although uh, you know, impl particular implementation like. Uh, I have quibbles, but uh, uh, but uh, just as a general point, that's sure. completely fine. And then the so, and then the other main concern, or when when again, size is asked, you know, what's why is your capitalization method giving such dramatically different results? And the other one was tax evasion, but there, it's it would seem to me the obvious thing would say, okay, but since size and Zuckman relies on income reporting, 
wouldn't evasion cut against that also? Like, in other words, so, so don't they have to say people are evading their estate taxes more than they're evading their income taxes? Yes, they have to. They have to say two things. Uh, uh, so one is right. Uh, uh, there is an assumption that uh, uh, that well. I think they are willing to say that uh, there is tax evasion uh, uh, that's related to income tax and that, uh, that you are not discovering all of the wealth that's really out there, that some may be sitting in the tax havens and things like this. So they, they are willing to, to say that. Uh, uh, so you know, that's one. So I, I, you know, but, I, I don't want to put words in, the, in their mouth, but uh, I think they are open to, uh, to saying that, uh, uh, that their capitalization method is uh, as, as much as it shows, that it's still even understating the extent of, uh, of, uh, of wealth inequality. But what you would have to have on the estate tax side is growing tax evasion. So uh, not just that there is a tax evasion, right. but you would have to have uh, much more tax evasion uh, you know, in uh, 2000. 10 or in 2000s than, uh, than you had in, uh, in the 1980s or 1970s. So the best, uh, uh, the best evidence or claim for that is that uh, there is a documented uh, uh, decline in, uh, uh, in resources that uh, uh, IRS has been putting into the enforcement of, uh, of the estate tax. So there was something that was happening on that side. The, the thing that pushes against it and that uh, always made me skeptical about uh, these types of uh, explanations is that uh, uh, basically the, the story becomes that uh, you know, this, this is a tax that used to be well infor- enforced and now it's poorly enforced. And there is, uh, there is an example that I like to bring up is, uh, uh, is a, an article from uh, 1973 that's called A Voluntary Tax. Uh, that uh, that was written by uh, by uh, by uh, by a lawyer, uh, uh, actually published in Columbia Law Review, that was uh, describing a lot of tax evasion techniques that were happening at th- those point, mm-hmm. at, at that point. And uh, uh, so tax evasion has been a constant. Uh, at the same time, the tax has always collected revenue. So the, there is a, there is a question of like you know, how how do you think about that? Uh, and uh, I think the answer, which is also related to my to some of my other work, is that uh, as much as people like to uh, uh, to reduce their tax liability, they really hate parting with their money before they die. Mm-hmm. Uh, they like control over their wealth, uh, and that's something that's actually pushing strongly in the direction of uh, of seeing a lot of that wealth on the estate tax returns. So despite you know the claims that uh, this is a tax that's easy to avoid. It, it does collect a lot of revenue, uh, so uh, or a lot. It, yeah. it collects decent amount of revenue. Yeah, and again, just for the listener, to make sure they're not losing the argument, the train of the thought here. You're not denying that there's tax evasion, but in order to explain different, so it would need to be that tax evasion has gotten worse over time if that's to explain why a, yes. a measure goes one way or the other. Like if if the rich people always just didn't report half of their wealth then yeah, the absolute numbers would be wrong, but that wouldn't change the distribution as it was, yes. was measured by your technique. So if you're seeing different trends in, in wealth concentration, then yeah. to cite tax evasion, yeah. yeah. And then, that's, uh, the, that's the gist of the argument. Yeah. And uh, basically, uh, this, uh, uh, we are not talking about small differences. Right. So, uh, so it, it would have to be you know, massive in, uh, increases in the extent of tax evasion. Mm-hmm. And then also too, what's interesting is a priori, you would expect as tax rates have come down, the incentive to engage in criminal behavior to save on your taxes would go down. So, I mean, yeah, I know there's an enforcement, uh, but... That's uh, that's true. The rates have come down. Uh, <laughs> but you're rolling your eyes at me. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they, were, they were in the, you know, 70% in the 1970s, and uh, by early 2000s, uh, the, the, the rate was, uh, I think, 55%, and then coming down to, uh, to, to 40% now. So they have come down. Uh, uh, the incentive is still strong. <laughs> sure, sure. But I mean, I'm saying, though, that it's... Yeah. You would think that, you know, there'd be something cutting for why evasion arguably might have gone down, or at least that's one factor that would push in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's right, but it's also technology yeah. uh, of sure. tax avoidance. Sure. So, uh, okay. that's, so that's kind of the race. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, if we could s- switch now to the more recent controversy. So uh, Size and, and Zuckman had a, you know, they have a new book that's come out and they had a, a very provocative article in the newspaper. They're claiming that the, 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 the top 
earn, or earners pay lower, a, a lower income tax rate, or, uh, pay a lower percentage of their income in taxes than the bottom 50% of the population. And, and so, and so that's of course a very provocative claim, but my understanding is the, the way they reach that result is they made some assumptions in their calculations that are not really the, what, what was standard in this literature. So yes. is, is, is what, if I, if I summarize it correctly, then can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah. So that's, uh, uh that's, uh, uh, that's a good way to put it. So, uh, so there are, uh, two things that go into, uh, into calculations like this. So one is, uh, just uh, measuring income uh, and measuring, uh, well, measuring income that uh, uh, that people have. So that's related to the literature on income inequality. And uh, I mean, if we have time, we can talk a little bit about that. There are some issues there and controversies there as well, mm. but they rely on uh, on their own estimates of income inequality that are from a paper that uh, that was published just last year in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. So they are using those numbers. Then, uh, in order to calculate the tax rate, you have to uh, for a, you know for a given group or a given individual, you know, you have to know how much taxes people pay. And that becomes uh, trickier uh, because, well, first you have to define what you mean by taxes uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whether you, you put taxes and transfers and what do you do about credits uh, and, uh, and things of that nature. You, you have, uh, uh, but, but even then, once you do that, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to think about all the different taxes that people pay. There is the income tax, so that's, uh, you know, we probably are not going to argue about uh, who is paying that, although we could even argue about that one. But like, you know, everybody assumes that uh, your income tax is your tax. But then you start thinking about uh, things like corporate tax. And uh, in the case of the corporate tax, you have shareholders and you have, uh, uh, so, you know, they, they are one potential party. But uh, you also have workers of the firm. Uh, so if you increase the corporate tax and uh, uh, and uh, consequence of that is uh, reduced wages for uh, workers, which is you know, one plausible and uh, contested but plausible claim, that's an issue. Uh, if you uh, increase taxes on corporations, but you don't do anything with, uh, say, uh, how you tax interest income, or you don't do things uh, related to foreign investments, or you don't do things to uh, non-corporate uh, uh, investments, then uh, you may have flows or, uh, to, to those other types of investments that's going to, uh, uh, to reduce uh, uh, the rate of return in those other sectors and has consequences. So there are uh, of assumptions along these lines. Then we can look at uh, things like uh, sales tax and uh, and ask, okay, if we increase sales tax, does it, uh, does all of it show up in the uh, uh, in the prices that people pay, or some of it uh, actually comes from the profits of of the businesses? So uh, it's sort of you 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 start thinking about uh, stuff like this. So we have to make some assumptions in all of this if you want to allocate all of the taxes that uh, that people pay to individuals. And that's the name of uh, of the game that they they want to play. They, uh, they actually want to take all of the taxes that, uh, that are paid in the US, just taxes, not transfers. They do transfers separately, but they don't get as much attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they want to uh, assign it to everyone. So they have to make a lot of these assumptions. Okay. So, so some of these are easier to grasp with others. So let's start with a simple one. So like the earned income tax credit, how do, do they, do they not count that as a, as a negative tax? No, they don't count that as a negative tax. Okay. Uh, so, so, so I may just do a double negative. So in other <laughs> words, a worker, I'm making these numbers up, but a worker who pays 10, who owes $10,000 in, in income tax, but then has a, an earned income tax credit of a thousand, a lot of people would say, oh, that person really just paid 9,000 in taxes, right. but they so, say he paid 10,000. So uh, actually, the way the way it works in practice is a little bit different. So uh, uh, the way it works in practice is that that worker would be paying not that much in income tax. Uh, let's say let's call it a thousand or maybe oh, even okay, zero. Sure. And, and and then uh, earned income tax credit is uh, I think as high as six thousand uh, dollars. Uh, and uh, it's something it's called a refundable tax credit. What that means is that uh, if your tax liability is uh, is actually you know, after accounting for this credit, is if it becomes negative, then you actually get money from mm -hmm. the government. So, oh, uh, okay, can so I ask? Yeah, can I ask you? So that was something. Is it just the refundable portion that they're yes. saying? Uh, that's my understanding. That they are not counting the refundable portion. Okay, so I mean that's that that's less crazy to me than what I originally thought. So, right, so, uh, so again, so, just for the, the listeners' benefit. 
So if there's a worker who has a very small income tax liability, but then because of the earned income tax credit, it actually flips such that that worker's getting a thousand dollars back from the gov from the IRS. If what we're trying to do is to figure out who pays a higher fraction of their income as taxes, you know, regular people or the super wealthy, some would argue, well, that person's actually paying negative taxes. So that should help bring down the effective tax rate on the bottom 50%. And they're not going to count that part. Because so, that, some, yeah. so that's uh, uh, so they are not alone in making this particular assumption. Okay. Uh, so that that one. Uh, uh, so personally, uh, I I wasn't terribly bothered by this this mm-hmm. particular assumption, although it has consequences for some other things that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that will come back to. But it, it sort of goes to uh, goes back to uh, to the question of uh, like what, what are you actually doing these things for? Like what do you want to uh, to illustrate or uh, or mm-hmm. describe? And uh, clearly, you know, if somebody is getting a transfer from uh, from the government that's going through the tax system, right. uh, that person is not necessarily like there is no sense in the, in which this person is paying uh, high taxes when uh, all of those taxes get refunded with an extra. Sure. Uh, so that's one point. Uh, the other point, which is a little bit more subtle, that uh, that relates to this earned income tax credit, is that. Uh, if you think about uh, just the income tax, then yes, this is a refundable portion. The original purpose of uh, of, uh, of introducing the earned income tax credit was uh, to actually offset payroll taxes, so taxes that pay for mm-hmm. Social Security and Medicare. So uh, you know, we could uh, make a legitimate claim that uh, uh, that if, even if you are sticking to this like you know, strict definition, taxes versus spending, which is kind of blurred in this context, uh, that uh, uh, you should be thinking about uh, refundable portion beyond uh, uh, the payroll tax. So much less is refundable because uh, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's actually returning the, uh, the payroll tax that you have already paid. But you, know, if, you have to make some calls here. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's not terrible. I think uh, it's not terrible if you are very clear when you present these numbers what they represent. Sure. Am I, is the biggest single choice the one, the one about the corporate tax incidents? No, so there are, I think there are two uh, two big choices that uh, that I uh, I would say are important. So uh, one is about the very bottom, uh, which is about uh, uh, actually it's pr- primarily about the sales tax, but it interacts with transfers. And the other one is uh, is about the corporate tax, and that uh, plays uh, plays the role at uh, at the top of the distribution. So I can uh, so since we talked about uh, earned income tax credit. Uh, 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 so here is uh, here is the problem uh, at the bottom of the distribution. Uh, so uh, uh, when you are uh, measuring taxes that people pay, uh, and let's say you look at uh, something like a sales tax, mm-hmm. uh, you know, gasoline tax, and and so on, uh, how much people at the bottom of the distribution pay? Well, they have you know, some disposable resources, uh, cash, uh, you know, uh, money that they can spend on things, and they finance consumption. So you can look at, the, at their consumption and calculate how much of sales taxes uh, is embedded in that, and uh, how much you know, gas taxes and tobacco and uh, and things like this are uh, are in that. So that that becomes your tax liability. Again, with lots of assumptions, but let's put that aside. Uh, then the question is, what are you dividing that by? <laughs> and uh, uh, and you know, part of the consumption would be an income tax credit, uh, mm-hmm. like that's money that you have. Uh, what are you dividing that by? And then, uh, their definition of income is uh, pre-tax, uh, pre-transfer income. So you don't, well, you count, the only transfer that you count is a big one, social security, but there are other transfers. So if you hypothetically imagine a person that uh, that has no other income, but, uh, uh, I don't know, welfare benefits, supplementers, supplemental security income, uh, actually earned income tax credit, that person has cash. Mm-hmm. Uh, according to their definition of income, that person has no income because this is all post-transfers. Uh, mm-hmm. So that person has zero in the denominator, but that person will have a uh, 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 sales tax liability because you know, that person consumes uh, right. and they've just assigned things to that person. So that becomes you know, a positive number divided by zero, the tax rate of infinity. So they will not show you infinity, but they will show you numbers that are skewed by, uh, uh, by the presence of, uh, of this type of effect. Okay, so let me just paraphrase. Um, 
So you're saying, you know, again, what they're, the provocative claim was, oh, you know, Warren Buffett pays a lower effective tax ra- income tax rate than, you know, some, some homeless guy or something like that. And, or yes. let's not say him, but like someone who's a janitor. And yes. the, and so of course, to, to talk about a tax rate means you're looking at total taxes paid, you know, in dollar terms divided by your income in dollar terms. And so there you're saying the denominator, you know, well, how are you going to measure it? And so they exclude benefits, you know, so like food stamps, but if a person's really spending, you know, an extra $5,000 on groceries because of food stamps, it's, it's, it's inflating their effective tax rate. If you're saying, no, no, that they didn't, let's not count that. So now their income is $5,000 less than it, in a sense, it really is. Or And yeah. so, th- so that's going to drive up the effective tax rate. So yeah. it's it's yeah. wrong to so think. Just, you know. I'm sorry, I'm not that generous, but uh, right. uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm making up numbers. But yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's okay. So, th- so that's that's another issue again, where the choices they're making, anyone in isolation, you know, it might be yet more or less plausible. But they're if they're all putting that, right. that's partly. So, uh, so this this particular choice is different uh, than uh, than what's done uh, by other people. Right. And uh, the consequence of that particular choice is that uh, you end up with uh, with an estimate of uh, of twenty percent of the tax rate at the bottom of the distribution as they show it, and uh, the way they show it is actually skewed even even more because. Uh, uh, kind of in recognition of this problem, they actually drop uh, uh, people who have very, very low income. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so the, you know, 27 million people are kind of out of their uh, out of their data that's used for, for constructing these tax rates because you know, right. if they were included, uh, you would see not 20% rates at the bottom, you would see you know, 50% rates at the bottom. R- right, because yeah. of, the, of the way how it's constructed. Yeah, and like like you said that yeah, if you took someone like who otherwise has no income from a job, and is getting assistance, yeah, they would that that lowest percentile would would have an infinite tax rate. Yeah, and that might strike people as wait a minute, how can that be? And then that yeah, so okay. Yeah. Um, so then the other main one in the the time we have here that I'd like you to explain for us, and this was the trickiest one is the in, the issue of corporate tax incidents. So can yes. you explain what that is and then why the right. decisions there affect, you know, the, 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 the result and, and okay. what, yeah. So, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, uh, with the bottom line. So, uh, they, uh, what, uh, uh, what that one affects, uh, is not necessarily the, the rate at the top right now, but uh, what it uh, what it affects is uh, how the trend looks like. Mm-hmm. So uh, so that issue basically turns uh, uh, what otherwise would be you know mild, uh, pretty mild trend toward uh, uh, less progressivity uh, into something that looks like you know, uh, progressivity uh, has been like falling down extremely quickly and uh, and uh, has been so, and that's been happening since the fifties. So uh, the issue there are there are a number of choices can, that, can, uh, that you can make there. Uh, why is it, can I stop you? So just on that one, just to make sure I caught that, you're saying this one decision can make the trend line either look like the tax code's progressivity has been roughly flat for 50 years versus oh, there's a significant yeah move towards regressivity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the, that's why this is such a big thing that okay. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, New York Times uh, uh, animation that uh, uh, that uh, you know the, that was based on all of this, it it, it was showing basically you know, as you go over the years, like things get uh, less and less progressive. So sure. it's this less and less progressive part that's uh, that's influenced by all of this. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, so the choices there are uh, first: uh, do you put anything on wages? Uh, and uh, 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 so, the, uh, is there any consequence of corporate tax on on wages? And uh, they say no. There is evidence from elsewhere that you know, that uh, there is some uh, effect on wages. It's like you know, contested literature. It was a big deal in the context of corporate tax reform. Uh, but okay, so they assume that, uh, uh, that there is no incidence on uh, on wages. That's I would say within the mainstream, but kind of on the extreme of the decisions that you could make. 
Then uh, uh, the new uh, assumption and uh, something that nobody uh, nobody does in this context is assuming that uh, all of the uh, all of the corporate tax uh, falls on shareholders and nothing falls on other types of capital, and that turns out to matter for actually a fairly subtle reason, and that is that. Uh, uh, like, you know, people at the top of the distribution, they own equities and they, they own bonds. Nowadays, they own about the same share of the overall equities and bonds. Uh, uh, but if you go back to the 1950s, they, they owned uh, uh, a higher share of the overall equities and smaller share of bonds. And like that difference uh, actually turns out to, uh, to make a huge difference in, uh, in how the trend looks like. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, this is an assumption that nobody else makes. Uh, they justify it by saying that they want to uh, rely on something called statutory incidents. So you know, it's a tax that's supposed to be paid by corporations. Uh, and uh, corporations are, are owned by shareholders. So statutory incidents, you know, they, they say, is on shareholders. And that describes the, the flow, of, uh, flow of funds. That's... You know that's not what the economic consequences of uh, of uh, of this tax are, and uh, what the full consequences of, of this tax would be. And that's a principle that's basically very inconsistently applied. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm open to like considering whether this makes sense, but they actually don't even go there. They don't say that uh, that this is actually reflecting the actual consequences of the tax. They say you know they want we want to use statutory incidents. They don't apply the same principle when they talk about the sales tax, for example, where mm -hmm. businesses have to pay the tax, not consumers. Right. right. Uh, so you know, we could have put it on business side, mm -hmm. but you are putting it on consumers, which which is fine by me, but uh, but the principle doesn't apply. Well, yeah. And, and the same with payroll tax. Uh, right. It's partial on employers, partial on employees. Okay, great. Yeah. So let me just because I I know what you're saying, but I bet many listeners don't. So that's a great point. So. The, the first, you know, just on the corporate tax one, because viewed in isolation, I think a lot of pe normal people would say, yeah, what's the problem? So because the corporate tax in terms of the law is levied on corporations and it's a corporation writing the check to the IRS, they're saying, yeah, so, um, you know, when we're trying to figure out who bears the burden of that. It's the corporate, it's the shareholders because they have less money because they have to write a check. And so since the corporate tax rate has come down dramatically because of the, you know, measure the, that Donald Trump signed, that's what's driving a big portion of the apparent regressivity, you know, uh, of the tax code and how it's evolved. And so you're saying in the literature, though, that they wouldn't normally do that. They would say a portion of the corporate tax, even though, yeah, the corporations are the ones writing the checks or their accountants are writing the checks. Um when you levy, a, when you like, like, for example, reducing the corporate tax rate didn't just mean shareholders who tend to be wealthier. Now, all of a sudden have a bunch more money. It's also that maybe wages went up somewhat, but in particular, the um, rate of return earned on other forms of capital also yeah. went up because it can't be, it can't be that you can earn more capital now in a corporate investments versus others. So it would, you know, capital. In, would in particular, the most obvious other form of cap, uh, capital uh, that, uh, that you, you should think about here is uh, corporate bonds. Right. Okay. That's another way that, uh, that uh, corporations are financed. So like, you know, there is a trade off between the, between those two things. Yes. And so, um, so, so your so number one is you're just saying in the literature, the reason they didn't just, sort of assume that the, the the ultimate bearers of the corporate income tax were the shareholders is because we know prices and rate, you know, wage rates, rates of return would adjust. So yeah. there's a sense in which, you know, the share, the corporation, you know, you could say passes it along with that's a little bit of a misleading term, but, the, but that, that sense in which the corporation is not the ultimate bearer of it. And then your point though, which I hadn't heard in reading this stuff is to say, okay, but even, you know, let, let's assume that they're right. And, you know, cause they could argue I've seen in some other justifications, they're saying, we don't want to make assumptions about how the corporate tax yeah, is born. Made assumptions. Right. <laughs> and so, and so they have, but okay, fair enough. But then you're saying, okay, but then by that same logic, rich business owners should have borne a hundred percent of all the sales taxes in the country because it's the business, you know, that, that pays it. Yeah. And yet they're assuming that the consumer is because they naturally assume a sales tax is passed along, you know, to, to the consumer. Yeah. And, and so, okay. And, and, and also with the, the empl employer share of the payroll tax you're saying, and they're the way they're doing the accounting, they're making the workers bear all of that. 
Yeah. Okay. Right. So, okay. So that, so that's your point being not only is it at odds with the literature, but even internally, they're not consistent. And, you know, I'm adding that you didn't say this, but I would say it, it looks like there's a pattern there into how they made the choice that which way exacerbates the number. So these, so these consequences or these choices of how they're going to treat things helps to explain why is their result so dramatically different from right. you know, what the conventional understanding had been in this right. literature. And in particular, it's uh, dramatically different from their paper, their own paper. Yes. A year ago. Yeah, yeah. And this, I know we've got about like 10 minutes left here. Uh, that's the last thing I'd like to talk with you about because that was really what blew my mind. So just to repeat that, I, I interrupted you <laughs> is that <laughs> it's not merely that their results differ from, you know, that what's standard in this literature, their results differ from their own paper that was published. Was it just literally a year ago? Yeah. Okay. And so, and then the, the other twist of the story, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't they change their, the online appendix of their data? Uh, well, so, uh, so that, uh, that one is a little bit trickier, but basically if you go uh, to the, uh, to the page that, uh, uh, that, uh, contains the data for the older paper, they basically uh, say that, you know, uh, it's superseded by the new numbers and right. uh, you can find, you can find the, uh, the old appendix. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. I don't mean to suggest paper. that they're yeah. like falsifying history, yeah, but, but, but yeah, I'm yeah, saying uh, the, uh, unless you are, you know, you know what's happening in that literature, the first, uh, and in their papers, the first thing that you would look at would be the new numbers. You, you wouldn't really see the, uh, you know, the way it's, it was done before. Right. So, so someone, yeah, just someone just going through the, doing a literature review, seeing, oh, it's published in the QJE. That's a, that's a good hit. Yeah. The, the, the data that now shows up for the attached appendix to that is different from what the referees looked at when that paper yeah. got a, published. Yeah. Uh, not that there's anything nefarious, but I'm just saying that that's a, so it's kind of an odd situation. Yeah, they, they, they uh, like in the in the appendix to the to the book, they say that uh, the new uh, calculation of uh, of progressivity supersedes the previous one. Mm -hmm. That's uh, yeah. Okay. Um. Another. So so do you, is that? I've never heard it. Is that unusual? Like, have you? I know you're a journal editor. What, what's is there a procedure for that normally? Like, if 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 authors come along and say to an editor, you know what we, you know, I mean, because that must happen once in a while. Like, some or they can just say there's a mistake. We got to fix this. So the results change, I guess. Uh, you know, the uh, the part that I didn't like about that, and th that's uh, that's a. Maybe that, that's a relatively small point, but it, uh, maybe it was a, another reaction at some point. Is that uh, like really, if you are a casual observer, you don't uh, you don't know exactly what's happening, and uh, and you want to go uh, and uh, you, know, you know about the QJE paper, you go to their website, you want to see how uh, uh, what the results were, you click on the on the obvious thing that's uh, on their web page, you you mm -hmm. will see something different, uh, and. Uh, 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 is it unusual? It seems to me a bit unusual because uh, really nothing dramatic changed uh, between the years. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, there is uh, there isn't for the most part there isn't new data. Like there is there is new data because they sort of do projections to 2017 and 2018 and they want to single out uh, Forbes 400 and uh, like say things about that. So there, that's these are kind of new parts. But uh, uh, for the bulk of what they are showing. It's the same data that they had before. Uh, so the only thing that changed is uh, assumptions of how to define these tax rates uh, based on you know, the same numbers that they had before. Okay. And again, this is coming from me, but that, and since those assumptions, if they had tried to submit that paper, I know you can't get inside the, the referee's head, but they would have gotten a lot of pushback yes, if they made it. <laughs> <laughs> The, yeah, they they would have gotten a lot of pushback if they had su submitted that originally because they were making so many assumptions that differed from the conventions. I, I would say these are uh, pretty uh, pretty unusual assumptions. And uh, look, I, I'm open to considering alternative assumptions, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think they, uh, like, having read uh, uh, their description of why they make those assumptions, they don't really make economic assumptions. They make sort of accounting assumptions. Sure, they right. don't. Uh, they don't try to uh, defend them as uh, as the actual economic uh, consequences of of of, of the tax. So mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah. Uh, 
there may be uses for this type of methodology, but uh, uh, but for thinking about how the tax system affects uh, you know, the well-being and how uh, the consequences are uh, distributed, I, in my view, these are not uh, very defensible sure. assumptions. Okay. And then w w one last qu question I had had, and I was trying to ask around, but couldn't find any a definitive answer. So th this idea of looking at the um, the the who you know the economic incidence of the of the ta of the corporate tax for example as opposed to the statutory incidence is that carried over i mean because in principle you could think of that even just on the personal income tax rate right that if if the us government raises the top, top income tax rate then really talented people they might move and yeah. so then that means the pre-tax salary of you know of of high of corporate lawyers might go up. And so th there's a, a sense in which you could say that the corporation bears some of the personal income tax for the top percentile. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, if you think about economic incidence of all of these things, uh, like these are empirical questions. And mm -hmm. uh, in all of these cases, like you know, the consequences could be much more complicated. So uh, uh, well, the, I would say that uh, basically on, on the incidence of each of those, uh, there is literature, there are controversies, we don't know what the exact numbers are, there are sort of certain things we think we know and assumptions that people would make, but, uh, but you know, uh, I'm very open to considering alternative evidence. Uh, but they, they don't really put mm -hmm. forward the alternative evidence to uh, to defend their Okay, but, but just to be clear, but so in the literature, they assume that the personal income tax is born 100% right. by the workers? Right, so, so the only exception uh, 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 most of the literature, there, are, there may be some minor exceptions. The, the, the bigger exception that I can think of is, uh, is actually related to the earned income tax credit. Uh, there are people actually try to study whether uh, when you provide transfers, some of, uh, some of those transfers uh, ultimately goes to, uh, uh, to employers rather than uh, employees. Sure. So there is a little bit of evidence there. Okay, but in, the, in terms of the, like, I'm just thinking when, when people especially like people on the right when they want to say stuff like, Oh, such and such percent of the income tax is paid by the top 2% of income. They're just, they're not doing economic models of incidents. They're just looking at the raw IRS yeah. data. And so I'm saying technically there could be an issue, but you think empirically it's probably okay in that kind of a situation? Uh, well, I would say that empirically, I don't really know. I don't have a better evidence. So it's not a question that, uh, uh, that's easy to study and that has mm -hmm. been very carefully studied. So people, uh, People assume that it's all on the uh, on the taxpayer that's uh, that's actually paying the income tax. Uh, I would be you know, very interested in seeing studies on this, but uh, but that's uh, that's not an assumption that people fight about. Okay, okay. Well, well. Thank you. Um, I think we got to wrap up here. Um, so, Vojtek, thank you so much for your time, and I, I know I learned a lot, and I hope the listeners did as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was fun to, to Okay, talk. and so so folks, if you go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 85, that's where I'll have a bunch of links to uh, Voitech's papers and some other things explaining uh, these recent controversies. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time.